is there a direct connection between the exercise methods of ancient Greece and Rome and the physical culture methods of the 1800s from which most modern exercise is derived? We'll answer that question for you today by revealing some major discoveries pertaining to the origin and development of exercise in the West. Now, a superficial connection between ancient Greece and Rome and modern exercise has long been obvious. The fact is that the classical world has long provided inspiration to modern athletes, the modern Olympics founded in 1896 being just one example. Imagery from ancient times was frequently used to promote athletic events in literature, book covers, posters, and athletic costumes throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. The Greeks and Romans were regarded as the ultimate icons of physical fitness and beauty, and were emulated in image and form by celebrities from Eugene Sandow to Arnold Schwarzenegger. And that's a trend that continues to this day. The first 19th century physical culture methods can, in some sense, be regarded as attempts to directly resurrect or revive the ancient classical approach to health and exercise. This revival, little discussed before today, took the basic concepts, the mindset, the approach to mind and body, breathing methods, the use of music, aesthetics, form, as well as specific techniques directly from ancient classical sources. To understand the story of how ancient exercise influenced the modern, we have to jump back in history more than 2,000 years when we have evidence for the creation and development of what modern scholars have referred to as the quote, ancient Greek medicalized school of gymnastics. That is, exercise, not for the purposes of competition, simple strength building, or looking good, but for the purpose of restoring and maintaining health. It's important to note that this was not the only school of gymnastics which existed at that time, as there were others which were more geared toward competition and other objectives, but which are not as relevant to this discussion. As far as we currently know, this medicalized school of gymnastics originates around 500 BC from a man named Icus of Tarentum, who is then followed by Herodicus of Salimbria in the 5th century BC, who is claimed by some ancients to be the teacher of Hippocrates. Hippocrates is regarded as the father of medicine and of course is quite famous today in the medical world and as the originator of the Hippocratic Oath. And Hippocrates did not write a lot about exercise, but we do know he taught and propagated this medicalized school of gymnastics. Hippocrates was followed by Theon, an athlete who wrote two treatises on exercise, supposedly quite good and extensive, but now unfortunately lost. Uh, these texts did not survive the Dark Ages like so many other important classical texts. And Theon is followed by Galen in the 2nd century AD, also known as Galenus. And fortunately for us, Galen wrote quite extensively about medicalized gymnastics and most of his writings have survived. Unfortunately, this school of medicalized gymnastics died out with the demise of ancient Rome. However, that's not the end of the story, because 1500 years later, during the early 19th century, an extraordinary man named Dr. Per Henrik Ling created a new, sophisticated system of exercise which became known as the Swedish Method. The Swedish Method was probably the single most influential method of physical culture in the 19th century, going on to have an effect to some degree on all other major physical culture movements and methods of the period. And a lot of that influence is still with us today. For instance, modern push-ups, pull-ups, and sit-ups can all trace their roots to Ling's Swedish method. When Ling created his method, he utilized a number of influences. Among the most prominent were the forms and ideas of ancient Greece and Rome. One of Ling's main disciples recounted, quote, Taking the ancients as models, Ling endeavored to give to his system the same enlargement and the same significance as the gymnastic science possessed in the most flourishing days of Greece. Ling's own writings confirm this to a great degree, containing dozens of references to the ancient Greeks and classical authors, particularly to Galen. For instance, in the preface to his magnum opus on gymnastics, Ling writes, quote, I pray God that future physicians and educators may one by one expand and improve these my experiments, 
for then gymnastics would once again have the same great significance among the northerners as it had in the minds of Plato, Hippocrates, and Galen. Throughout his writings, Ling makes very clear that he has read these authors and is familiar with their ideas. While speaking about the form and quality of his own gymnastic exercises, Ling states, quote, If the movement takes place according to these laws, I think it's safe and in accordance with the system of the great gymnasts of the past, Hippocrates and Galeni. So, back to question one. How did the idea and theory of the ancient Greek medicalized gymnastics influence Ling on a fundamental and conceptual level? According to Galen, the objective of gymnastics is, quote, health. Galen emphasizes that excessive athleticism, when winning supplants health as the objective, tends to be destructive rather than healthy because, quote, in reality it is a bad occupation because it does not aim at man's inner cultivation so that he will become better, but simply aims at the athlete obtaining such a strength that he will be able to beat the opponent. Galen also says that exercise is comprised of swift exercises for agility, which produce slender, compact bodies like those of dancers, and vigorous exercises, or strength exercises, which produce thick, heavy bodies such as those of strong men. Galen says that the ideal physique is a more balanced, moderate median between these extremes. Ling, in his writings, makes the same points and takes the same approach. He also organizes his method into the exact same divisions as Galen, designating educational gymnastics for the already healthy and medical gymnastics intended to restore the health of the sick or infirm. In other words, physical therapy, which, as stipulated by Galen, also included massage. According to Galen, gymnastics is a division of hygiene, and Ling states the same thing. Cultivation of both mind and body. Another fundamental aspect taken from the ancient Greeks was the focus on the mental as well as the physical. According to the ancient Greeks, quote, it is not only the body but the mind of such a person which we are to train. The health and vigor necessary for the practice of what is good depend equally on both mind and body. Even in the process of thinking, in which the use of the body seems to be reduced to a minimum, it is a matter of common knowledge that grave mistakes may often be traced to bad health, and because the body is in a bad condition, loss of memory, depression, discontent, insanity often assail the mind so violently. So this is all very important because what it means is that Ling took the same mindset as the ancient Greek school and that informed and guided everything in the design of his method. There was a big problem Ling encountered, however, for although the surviving Greek and Roman treatises provided a rich theoretical and conceptual framework on which to base a method, they are sparse on actual techniques. Ling, in fact, says about Galen's prescriptions, Quote, the forms of the medical gymnastics of antiquity are a secret to us. Forms meaning the actual specific techniques. So Ling had a lot of blanks to fill in. He had to come up with the techniques themselves, and these he took from the influences of his own time, from fencing, dancing, military positions and exercises, and extant gymnastic methods like those of Noctegal and Gutsmuth. Ling took aspects from all of these disciplines, modified them, blended them together, and added in his own techniques, repurposing it all according to his own holistic theories and ideas of health. The fact that his method was based on all these different elements does not take away from its brilliance and originality, as no one had ever done anything like this before. On a practical level, there are a few other major ideas that Ling incorporated from the ancients. Breathing. The ancient Greek concept of pneuma means both breath, spirit, and soul. In the medicalized gymnastic context, pneuma was the material that sustained life and consciousness in the body, a sort of psychic substance that brought movement to the brain and the heart. In his writings on health, Galen mentions the exercise of, quote, deep breathing, which works the thorax and the lungs. Deep breathing exercises became a part of both the Swedish and German physical culture methods. Hippocrates also mentions the exercise of holding the breath. 
Ling took note of these ideas, which he found paralleled old Scandinavian concepts and beliefs. Quote, the sages of antiquity made such a concept of the threefoldness of human existence, such as soul, spirit, and body. This also agrees with the old northerners' notions of this, for by spirit was meant the soul, united with the body, and before that it was called breath. Ling therefore gave breath and specific breathing exercises a prominent place in his Swedish method. All daily Swedish exercise sessions concluded with breathing exercises. The use of music. Music often played a role in ancient classical exercise. The Spartans, for instance, were said to perform group calisthenics and transitions between various warlike postures to live music. There are also many ancient visual representations and descriptions of exercise being performed to music, such as jumping with halters, which were ancient hand weights. Plato wrote in his famous Republic, quote, he who best blends gymnastics with music and applies them most suitably to the soul is the man whom we should most rightfully pronounce to be the most perfect and harmonious musician. While Ling and the early Swedes did not exercise to music, the German Turner physical culture movement did. When one of their early masters, Adolf Spice, introduced calisthenics in the 1840s, he quote, arranged his free and order exercises and round dance in such a way that a piece of music could be played or a song could be sung. This custom spread quickly and widely to school gyms. Even in gymnastic club halls, it was not uncommon for free, order, and stability exercises to be carried out to the accompaniment of suitable pieces of music. One German Turner wrote, quote, In classical antiquity, music was an integral part of competitions. And for this reason, a flute player is very often depicted in pictures of ancient Greek gymnasts. We have always liked to have music at hand at our festive gymnastic occasions, whether it played at festive parades or accompanied the exercises. There is no doubt that it has a satisfying effect when gymnastics and music go hand in hand this way, and certainly the cultivation of rhythmic feeling can only gain from it. The German Turners also took their own motto, a sound mind in a sound body, from the ancient Roman poet, Juvenal. The form. The ancient Greek and Roman authors place great emphasis on form. Galen, when describing one exercise, states that, quote, if there is any concealed error which goes unnoticed, then the exercise, quote, becomes weaker. Ancient artwork also shows trainers using sticks to correct the form of the gymnasts. This was something emphasized by Ling, who, along with subsequent teachers of the Swedish method were known to be perfectionist and adhere to a zealous focus on form. Ling also looked at the forms and positions in classical art and brought some of that into his method. Ling, being a fencing master, brought fencing methods into his mechanics. However, the extra deep lunge which was characteristic of his method was reportedly modified by ancient Greek positioning. According to one Swedish author, Quote, P. H. Ling demanded that outward lunging should be taken with a long step and that the front leg from the knee downward should be parallel with the rear leg. This demand is hardly ever fulfilled nowadays, but Greek sculpture shows that the ancient Greeks did fulfill it. Those who fully carry out that demand will realize what a great effort must be made both in the knee joint and in the ankle joint. Ling also took note of the nimbleness and delicate form of the hands and fingers seen in ancient art writing, quote, The fingers, arms, back, and knees of our peasant recruits, bent and stiff from habit and heavy work, need to be straightened, rather, not the other way around, at least the hands, to be softened for the more relaxed handling of weapons. The immortal patterns of antiquity do not clench their fists unnecessarily. To those ends, and to better prepare his students for the martial arts, Ling's method utilized a frequent stretching of the hands and fingers, as well as quick shooting motions of the arms to counteract the stiffness cultivated by modern life and labor. Galen, in his chapter on swift exercises, also mentions, quote, going on the tips of one's toes and, quote, stretching up both hands, both of which Ling made part and parcel of his own method in the form of heel elevations and the stretch arm positions. Specific exercise techniques reconstructed directly from ancient sources. In addition to Ling, 
the German Turners were particularly interested in the classical world. In his first book, the founder of the Turners, Friedrich Ludwig Jahn, includes a large bibliography full of Greek and Roman authors. Several other prominent Turners, such as Otto Jaeger, published books examining Greek and Roman exercise in immense detail. In their Turner exercise treatises, ancient classical exercises were often described and directly emulated. To cite just one example, in the dumbbell text of Turner author Moritz Kloss, ancient dumbbell exercises are discussed in the introduction to his book, wherein he recounts an ancient exercise in which the gymnast lunges and picks the dumbbells up off the floor, alternating sides. Then, later in the book, Moritz shows this exact technique as part of his own exercise regimen. From this time on, many other physical culture methods arose that were influenced by the Swedes and German Turners. So that Greek and Roman influence that we have just discussed can be found in those too. And you also have many texts and many articles by individual teachers comparing the ancient positions and techniques to their own, and often drawing from them. And a couple of authors took their zeal for the classical world even further by creating entire methods based directly on the images found in ancient sculptures, mosaics, and on pottery. All of this is merely the tip of the iceberg, but it hopefully gives you a better understanding of the connection between 19th century physical culture and the ancient world. Although many athletes today idealize the ancient Greeks and Romans, it is with some irony that it was the brilliant gymnasts of more than 200 years ago who perhaps came closest to realizing the principles and ideals of the ancient Greek gymnastic school. In the future, along with our 19th century exercises, we will examine some of the ancient exercises in greater detail. If you'd like to know more about these exercises in even greater depth and how they are done, please consider supporting us on Patreon, a link to which can be found in the video description below. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.